We're here at Bell Laboratories where I have Dr. Robert Wilson next to me and Dr. Arno Penzias who have just uh, been informed that they've received the 1978 Nobel Prize in Physics. What does one do when you first hear about winning a Nobel Prize? Oh, I was very pleased about it. The first thing I did was try to wake up because I, I learned from a telephone call when I was or I was still asleep. And then the next question is the authenticity of the, of the news. It takes a while for it to soak in that it's all real. I suppose there are pranksters in this world that might call you up and tell you you won the Nobel Prize. What about you, Arnold? And we know several of them. Yeah, <laughs> I see. There have been, uh, there have been a number of uh, predictions, some frivolous, some serious, uh, over the years, but uh, this particular year there was rather more than the usual spate of rumors. Uh, Bob and I have received a number of awards for this discovery in the past, and so to some people at least it seemed possible that we would win. So uh, the possibility, I suppose, always uh, of winning is there, but until it happens, it's not quite real. Not real. And well, even after it's happened, it's not really <coughs> quite real. I think <laughs> it'll take a few days of getting used to. What about your families? Did they uh, uh, react in any uh, wild manner or take it fairly calmly? How did, uh, how did they react? Mine took it rather calmly. Well, my son is a... Uh, is a is a college student. He has two exams today, and he I talked to him last night, and he was trying to study for them, and he's trying to stay calm because he has to pass both those exams today, and that's going to be hard for him. My daughter was one of my two daughters was home, very excited, of course. Uh, the other one is over at a friend's house. Uh, she got out of bed and then went to a neighbor over there. Another one of her friends lived, and the uh, father. Uh, of that family, tried to call and he couldn't, put on his sweatsuit and ran over about a mile and a half and I was glad to see him. He said hello. So the enthusiasm is infectious. What is it exactly in, in simple terms uh, that you received the, the Nobel Prize for? What did you do? Well, we received the prize, as they said, for discovering the microwave background radiation but the real question is, what does that mean? And skipping all of the intermediate steps, what's that, what that means is that we live in a uh, Big Bang type of universe, a universe with a specific origin beyond which we can't ask questions. Uh -huh. Could you uh, amplify on that at all, uh, Dr. Well, Penzias? Well, just to set the scale, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, the sun is a star. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, contains perhaps 100 billion stars. And that cloud of 100 billion stars is one tiny speck in the universe. And each of those tiny specks, and there are many of them, are flying apart as the result of this explosion that Bob had just mentioned. And if you turn time backwards, then it means if they're moving, say one is here and one is here, and they're moving like that, if we think what ha where, is they co where are they coming from, we just turn it around, you know, make, make time play backwards, we find that there was a time when they were all in the same place. That instant in time, all the galaxies, all the matter of the universe was in one place. At that instant, it was given an outward velocity. Each part was somehow thrust away from every other part. And the energy of that outward thrust uh, it manifests itself in, in terms of heat. Just that the heat of an inside of an oven is hot. You can feel it, you put your hand in it. In that same way, there is this radiation. And that radiation expands with the rest of the universe, and as it expands, it cools. And that radiation, that remnant of that radiation, is here till the present day. It's a small amount, but it's everywhere. And this radiation was, in fact, what we found. Its spectral shape is such as to be that of a black body, which is unique in uh, outer space. There's nothing, there are, while there are many emissions of various kinds, none of them have that unique spectral shape that is predicted from this theory. And in fact, that's what we found. We confirmed the theory, rather unexpectedly, I might add. Um, wh when was it that you did that work? 
what years? Uh, I imagine it took several years to uh, to actually do the work. Uh, this was done between 1963 and 65, or something like something that. Something like that. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And um, what were you looking for when you originally started to look? If that's what you were doing. Well, I mentioned that our sun is a star in the Milky Way, and the, this cloud of stars contains not only stars but contains a certain amount of gas as well. And some of this gas is very, very hot, and the electrons from that gas are very energetic, and they radiate. And we were looking for the radiation from those hot, energetic electrons in the Milky Way. To distinguish that radiation from radiation uh, closer in, radiation, say, from the atmosphere or the ground or the solar system, was the function of our experiment. It turned out that there was an additional component of radiation which didn't come from closer than the outer portions of the Milky Way, but it kept, in fact, we found, came further away. That the universe itself, beyond the Milky Way, was radiating. That was the unexpected result. So we were looking for radiation from the Milky Way, and in fact, found radi radiation from beyond it. Uh, how, how do you do that, uh, uh, Dr. Wilson? Can you, when you say, uh, from beyond it, you look in a different direction, you look over it, or? Well, the unusual thing about this radiation is that it comes to us from all directions. The galactic radiation we were going to look for uh, would have been somewhat uh, changed in, with different directions because we're inside the galaxy and not exactly in the center. But in any case, the radiation we found was much more intense than the galactic radiation was expected to be from other measurements. So what we do, or what we did, was use an antenna whose properties are very good for this measurement. That is, it looks in the direction you point it, and it doesn't see radiation coming from other directions. So that it's, it's a kind of a narrow beam, like a telescope. Yeah, it's, it's not a really... Uh, as te radio telescopes go, it doesn't have a really narrow beam, but it doesn't have reception from all over, a little scattered reception. It's all concentrated in the same general direction. So that by measuring the amount of radiation coming out of that antenna, we then measure the radiation coming from the sky without contribution from the Earth. When did you first suspect you had something really important, that, that this was, uh, well, you discovered that there was something there that you hadn't counted on, and uh, apparently it was quite difficult to pin down exactly uh, what it was. Is that, uh, is that true? Yes, that's true. We, <coughs> we found this radiation. We had eliminated the Earth as an explanation, the solar system, and in fact the entire galaxy, the Milky Way. We were left with the conclusion that this radiation either was coming from something beyond the Milky Way, which in, was inconceivable to us, or was uh, some mistake that we made. That was always a possibility. A defect in the antenna, something like that. A number of things. Like so you that. had to work for some period of time Until to, we, to convince yourself yeah. it wasn't a defect we, in the antenna. We had convinced ourselves, we thought, at least we had gone through everything that we had thought to get rid of this radiation, and in fact, it was still remained. Uh, at that point, uh, the question of what to do with the result came up, and we were about to publish it as part of another paper on a different subject and just add it as an additional conclusion when a conversation I had with a, a colleague from uh, MIT led, led us to the knowledge that there had been a theoretical prediction of such a radiation. And that, that was written up in a paper by Jim Peebles at Princeton University. I called up Bob Dickey at Princeton, who sent us a preprint of that. And very close thereafter, having the explanation, uh, when Dickey looked, at, looked over our work, uh, was convinced that our measurements were reliable and accurate, uh, we, came with, we came to the realization rather slowly that his the theory that he was espousing uh, would, in fact, be one of the explanations. We didn't know if it was the explanation, but we felt a lot more comfortable. Uh, Eddington, the famous astrophysicist, once said that never 
tr fully trust any measurement for which there's not at least one explanation. Well, pretty soon afterwards, there were several explanations, but it turned out that the first explanation was the correct one. Uh, if I could go back for a minute, when, when you first started to do the experiments, were they connected with, with uh, any particular kind of radio propagation research that you were preparing to do? Uh, the particular project and the motivation was specifically for measuring radiation from the Milky Way. Uh, as part of that work, of course, we were measuring uh, a number of things which uh, helped us in our other work, which had to do with satellite communications, the development of low noise receiver, the understanding of antennas, uh, uh, me precise measurement techniques, things of this sort. So there were a number of other things that we were doing at the same time so it's rather hard to separate. There's kind of a, there's a feedback, a flow back and forth of information from one to the other. We worked on a number of these other projects using similar equipment, sometimes the same equipment. Bob uh, uh, spent a great deal of time over the years gathering data, uh, radiation from the sun, for example, which was used to infer what uh, a satellite at the same wavelength would be, would be subject to. Before there were satellites in the sky as sources, Bob was measuring the sun using techniques very much like the technique we use in the microwave background. And in that case, uh, even though the equipment was really very similar, uh, the motivation was entirely for satellite communications. So uh, it's very hard to separate them. The very specific project was an astrophysics project. But uh, since these things move back and forth, there's this flow from pure research to applied research, it's really hard to uh, I'm sorry I'm giving you such a long answer, but really the research f fits in and is such a, an integral part of the applied research, the basic research and the applied research, that it's really hard to say uh, what you were doing at any one time. But wasn't that antenna made originally to do some kind of uh, Telstar work? It was uh, made for Project Echo. Project Echo. To receive Echo. a signal from the Echo balloon, uh -huh. transmitted Which, by JPL. Uh huh. And then then it was modified for Telstar. The Maser amplifier that we actually used was built for Telstar and put on the antenna. But at that point, that antenna, the whole installation was not needed for Telstar anymore. And so we set out to do some astronomy with it. You came here in 1963 to, uh, did you come here specifically to work with Dr. Dr. Penzias or, or just to work in the general atmosphere that, uh, that was here. I mean, what uh, what brought both of you to Bell Labs? <clears throat> I interviewed Bell Labs because I was interested in the atmosphere, and uh, <clears throat> after interviewing a number of places in Bell Labs, it seemed nice to continue the astronomical work with Arno. Mm -hmm. So I actually chose that part of Bell Laboratories for that purpose. And and so uh, Arno, you were here. Uh, 18 months or two years uh, like that, right. uh, before, and what reason did you uh, pick to come here? Well, it was a combination uh, of things. In fact, it's a little ironic. Uh, I didn't come here with the thought of being a permanent radio astronomer. I had thought of coming to Bell Labs, but uh, it never occurred to me at the time that uh, I would continue to do radio astronomy, but I didn't want to start by wrapping up my thesis. So I came. Uh, to Rudy Kompfner, who was then the director of the laboratory, which I'm now the director, and after some interviewing, uh, said, uh, you have these wonderful facilities here. Uh, I'd like to do some radio astronomy with them. Uh, and Could I have a temporary job to do that and then go on and do something else? Uh, with the idea being that maybe you know, he would want to interview me all over again for a permanent job. But Rudy uh, said, well, why not take a permanent job? You can always quit. And in fact, I took the permanent job, continued the, uh, I started uh, almost immediately working on the ECHO project in addition to, this, that's a satellite, the ECHO satellite project in addition to my radio astronomy, combined the two. Uh, and uh, as soon as Bob came, things really took off. The two of us continued this, uh, have continued this uh, close and profitable association all these years.